Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Edge of Eternity, Bill Cameron. I'm Bill Cameron, and this is the Sunday Night Service in the Garage. So glad to have you all here tonight, and I just ask that you would be blessed by the Word of God and, and the things that we talk about. There's so much blessing in God's Word, and He tells us that when we read it and hear it, that we will receive blessing, especially if we do what it says. So that's what our goal is, to learn more about the Bible and to uh, uh, do what it says, put it into practice. Tonight we're going to be talking about uh, Daniel chapter 5, and I'll open with a word of prayer and we'll get right into it. Father, thank you so much for this great book that you've given us. First of all, the whole Bible. And then, Father, this book of Daniel, which is so incredible with the information that it tells us it lays out some things for us to understand, and then it tells us about the future, and it's so awesome. We're just into that part right now. So bless us, guide us, help us to learn. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's get right into it. Take your Bibles and turn to uh, Daniel chapter 5, the usual thing. See there, it's not quite in the middle, just a little bit before the middle of your Bible, and uh, that will get you close to Daniel, and then you can flip around and find out from there. Of course, you can look in your uh index or table of contents in your Bible. So tonight, the writing on the wall. Have you ever heard that statement before, the writing on the wall? Hey, didn't you see the writing on the wall? You know, that's something that somebody might say at work about a situation or something. I'm sure you've heard it, and uh, tonight you'll find out where it came from. Now, I want to give you just a brief history on Nebuchadnezzar um, and what tonight is about. It's about taking some gold and silver, some beautiful, precious goblets that were used in the temple. And when Nebuchadnezzar took over Israel and that part of the world, he knew that these vessels, I'll call them, were set aside solely for worshiping God and for his purpose. And when we talk about being the word sanctified, you know, we've talked about that in the past. And you can go back and look at those messages that means to be set apart for God, to be used by him. And so they were part of the worship that would take place in the temple. So Nebuchadnezzar said, I'm going to take those back. So he took them back to uh, his kingdom and he stored them away and kept them safe. Never used them, never defiled them, just had them stored away. And so uh, at the end of his reign, uh, we see Belshazzar. That's his son. Some people say grandson. We won't worry about that. It's just that he was one of the next in line for the kingship of the uh, uh, of the Babylonian Empire. But he was a very heathen king. Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar, both very prideful people, extremely prideful. That was their fall, uh, that the pride took them both down. And you'll see that as we go through this tonight. Now, after seeing the things that Daniel could do, Nebuchadnezzar did develop a true, deep respect for him. And that respect for him came because he could see that he really did trust his God 100%. Nothing could get between Daniel and his God. And that's how we should be. That's a great lesson for us to learn from this because look at what Daniel was able to do and it's only because of his relationship and his obedience to God and his commandments and things that he had been, been taught as he was growing up. Now, he stored away these goblets. And now Belshazzar, King Belshazzar, is in charge. Nebuchadnezzar is dead. Belshazzar is in charge. And he's a bit more of a rabble rouser. Uh, so one night he decided, man, we're going to have a party, big party. It's going to be awesome. And he brought a thousand of his friends and just they were living it up. I mean, music playing, dancing, you know, drinking and just whooping it up like crazy. And uh, he got to a point where he said, you know, when I was growing up, my dad wouldn't let me touch those goblets. But tonight, go get those goblets out because we're going to have some fun. And then... They drank from the goblets and they worshiped the gods of gold and silver and wood and so on and so forth, taking away from the sanctity of what these goblets were set aside for. God does not take lightly to that. Now, 
I'd like to read for you from Proverbs 29, verse 1. Write that down. I'll have it on the screen, of course. Um, and I want you to take heed to this warning. Proverbs 29, 1. Whoever remains stiff-necked after many rebukes will suddenly be destroyed without remedy. Now, God is merciful and God is full of grace and he wants to help us in our lives. But if we keep telling him no and slapping him in the face time after time, you know, the longer you say no, the harder it is to say yes. And the New Testament talks about people giving themselves up to a reprobate mind. In other words, nothing's going to change their mind. They've decided against God and they're going to live the way they want to, the way Satan leads them, the way the world draws them. Don't do that. We need to develop a loving relationship with God because when we have a relationship with God, he will help us in great and mighty ways. Listen to how uh, Daniel chapter 5 verse 4 begins. As they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. And it's funny that most of those were part of the statue that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream. Not only are they drunk, okay, not only are they drunk and out of their minds, but they're taking these goblets and desecrating what God has called holy. God will not put up with that. I pray for our country because we're going downhill so fast. All of these things that society is telling us are okay are not okay. And as a nation, we are going to be held accountable for that. Now, as a believer, you're held accountable. I'm held accountable for what we do as a believer. And that's important. But the nation has turned away from God Almighty. It's obvious. So they took those goblets and praised the gods of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone, using the goblets to desecrate him. Now, 5 and 6, verses 5 and 6. Suddenly, now, this will make a drunk person wake up real quick, okay? And um, Belshazzar was drunk. Suddenly, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall. Can you imagine? You're sitting there, you're tipsy, and, and all of a sudden, just a hand appears on the screen, or on the scene, and, and is writing something on the wall, giving you a message, and then it's gone. I don't know about you, but that would make me uh, feel a little bit concerned. So suddenly, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote, his face turned pale and he was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. Now, what happens sometimes in our lives when we're not following God? Sometimes he shows up in our lives in a way that should really grab our attention. And we need to listen to that. We need to be aware of God's presence with us and what we're doing with this salvation that he has provided us with. The king summoned his enchanters, astrologers, and diviners. Then he said to these wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and tells me what it means will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around his neck, and he will be made the third highest in the entire kingdom. So Daniel is willing to give the third highest position to whoever can solve this problem, can see and read the writing on the wall and then interpret it. Uh, Daniel, uh, verse 8 here in chapter 5, that all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or tell the king what it meant. So King Belshazzar became even more terrified, and his face grew more pale, and his nobles were baffled. Well, no doubt they're baffled. They don't have God's spirit living in them. They don't have a connection with the true God who understands all things. There's a scripture in the New Testament that basically says, the unspiritual cannot understand things of the spirit. When we receive Jesus Christ, we receive his spirit also, the Holy Spirit, and becomes a part of us and enables us to learn these lessons and understand them more thoroughly than we could ever before knowing him. Uh, verses 10 through 12, the queen. Now, this queen isn't uh, Belshazzar's wife. This is his most likely his mother. Could have been grandmother, but most likely his mother, 
who had been married to Nebuchadnezzar. Hearing the voices of the king and his nobles came into the banquet hall. May the king live forever, she says. They always like to say that. Even Daniel said that. Don't be alarmed. Don't look so pale. There's a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. They always talk about the gods in plural. There is one God and his name is known to us as I am, the great I am, and Jesus Christ, the Son of God. They are one. And then the Holy Spirit, three in one. There is one God made up of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. In the time of your father, he was found to have insight and intelligence and wisdom like that of the gods. It was wisdom of the gods. It was the God. It was the wisdom of God Almighty in heaven. Your father, King Nebuchadnezzar, appointed him chief of the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners. He did this because Daniel, whom the king called Bel Belteshazzar, was found to have a keen mind and knowledge and understanding and also the ability to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve difficult problems. Call for Daniel and he will tell you what this writing means. Well, of course, that's what he did. So Daniel comes to the banquet room and the spiritual one, Daniel, will solve this message and explain it to King Belshazzar. So Belshazzar welcomes Daniel and he tells him his wise men and all that he asked them to do and they couldn't do it. And, and, uh, but he knows that Daniel has a relationship with his God and his God provides him with answers to questions and helps him to understand things better. And he offers Daniel the same reward. And, and Daniel says to him, you know, you can keep your reward. I don't need your reward. I don't want to be rewarded from you for what God is doing. And so Belshazzar kind of ignored that. And he reminds Belshazzar of his father, how he had such great pride. He was the greatest ruler in the world at the time. I mean, his, his uh, kingdom went over th three different continents. He was in Africa, in Europe, and in Arabia, I mean, a massive area, more area than anyone has ever been ruler of before. And um, he was the most powerful earthly king to ever live. Now, Belshazzar never became that powerful. He didn't last that long. Uh, when pride finally overtook him, he was made like an animal living in the forest and eating the grass. We studied that just a couple of weeks ago. He literally lost his mind. He was given the mind of an animal and he was out in the forest scrounging for food and shelter, just like the animals had to do. But then after seven years, the Lord restored his mind and his kingdom. But then he was gone shortly after that. Um, so think about Daniel's visions, the beasts, um, a lion that's powerful and strong and coming to devour people. That man is yet to come to this earth, but he will one day. And the people of the earth, apart from Christians, will bow down and worship him. You see, these stories in Daniel, these historical recordings, are telling us something and then giving us an example of what happened in history past. But at the same time, Daniel was writing about a time to come, history future. And that time is knocking at the door right now. <clears throat> Daniel tells Belshazzar that pride destroyed his father and it's going to destroy him too. So here comes the reading from the wall and the interpretation. This is in Daniel 5, 25 through 28. You might want to look at that as I read. This is the inscription that was written. Mine, mine, tekel parson. Here is what these words mean. Mine, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Peres, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Well, I wonder what Belshazzar is thinking right about now because he was already scared. He was already nervous. He was already very anxious. So let's look at what these numbers or these words mean, okay? Uh, mine means number. Have you ever heard the saying, his number is up? 
comes from here. So many things that you say every day, maybe I don't realize it, come right from the Bible. Your days are numbered. Your number has come up. That comes from the book of Daniel. So God wrote on the wall, mene, mene, meaning, have you ever heard the phrase, your number was up? Well, Daniel, not, or Belshazzar, now you've heard it. Your number is up. Then he wrote tekel, which means wait. It means wait. Babylon was getting ready to fall, and the Medes and Persians were going to come and, and collectively take over this vast kingdom that, uh, that Nebuchadnezzar had built up. And now uh, Belshazzar was running, and he was running it foolishly, and he ran it into the ground. Kind of reminds me of a president I've heard of, but another story. So what happens? Babylon is becoming a lightweight. Babylon is weak. Babylon has no more power. Babylon is falling. We need to remember that in our country. Pretty soon, our number may come up. Our number personally may come up any day. Trust in Jesus Christ. He is the only way to save us from this kind of thing. If this nation that we're in now doesn't repent, we're going to be turned over to become a nation of a reprobate mind. Not the Christians living in the nation, but the nation as a whole. I mean, all of these crazy protests and things that are going on. I mean, crazy stuff. And we need to get our act together. Now, the next word is Perez. And the next word means divisions. So the King James Version also uses the word uh, eupharsin. Same word, just spelled a little bit differently, which means the very same thing. Uh, but if you're reading in your King James, I want you to take note of that. Now, Babylon, the gold head, is now falling, and it is being divided between the Medes and the Persians. So, we've been looking at Babylon with Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar and Darius. Now, we're looking at the Medes and the Persians. And then, we're going to have the ancient Greeks next, followed by ancient Rome, which is going to end this part of scripture until the restored Roman Empire returns, and that is coming together as we speak. We're entering into a time where kingdoms will fall, and here's what Ezekiel says to us in chapter 21, verse 27. A ruin, a ruin, I will make it a ruin. The crown will not be restored until he whom it rightfully belongs to shall come. To him I will give it. That is God the Father's prophecy about his son, Jesus Christ. One day there will be peace in this world, but not until the Prince of Peace returns. From that now on, you're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars, just like the Bible says. You're going to see brother against brother, nation against nation, people against people. It's just going to get worse and worse. We need to be right with our God. Remember the feet of the statue that we talked about a few weeks back? They were iron mixed with clay. So they were also divided. And it was partly strong and partly weak. And that's going to be what the revived Roman Empire is going to be like. Uh, because there's going to be leaders who want to be leaders, and then they get overpowered and so on and so forth. Uh, but the Santa Christ is going to be able to hang on to things, and uh, his will will be done. Now, Verse 29 and 30 in chapter 5 of Daniel. Then at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple. A gold chain was placed around his neck. And he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in kingdom. In the kingdom, that very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain. I guess that made Daniel second in line. And Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. Now, I'm sure they came in and they clothed him and put the the uh, gold chain around his neck, and I'm sure he disposed of that. He wanted nothing to do with that kingdom. God measures us by his standards, not our standards. That's what happened with Nebuchadnezzar. That's what happened with Belshazzar. That's what will happen with Darius. You see, all of these things are taking place because of disobedience to God and his will. 
Today in this world, we, we fall for different things, but it's all coming around for full circle. You know what they say? What goes around comes around. And we're seeing the world change rapidly. We need to be aware of that and we need to be careful. So we need to look at the Bible, God's word, in order for us to have understanding of how we ought to live and who we need to trust. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. None of us can escape that. And the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Our wages, what we deserve for what we've done, is death. But God has made a way by trusting in his son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life on the cross, who shed his blood, who was buried and rose again, defeating death in the grave. And he stands on high at the right hand of his father right now, waiting for you to say yes to him. Deep faith it takes. I mean, you have to believe it. You can't just say a, a prayer real quick and say, hey, man, I'm saved. Okay, good. Now I'll just go on and do whatever I want to do. No, 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 no. Faith. It's by faith, and with that faith, we demonstrate that God is living in us because of our actions and the things we do to honor him. Let's pray. Lord, we know it's too late for Belshazzar, but it's not too late for us who hear this message. We can accept Jesus Christ as our Savior and come into relationship with you if we do it by faith, trusting and believing what the Bible says. Father, we hold this Bible dear. We trust everything that it says. And we ask you, Lord, to increase our faith and to increase our understanding. And Lord, for those who may not have accepted you yet as their Lord and Savior, I pray that they would confess to you through Jesus that yes, I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. And I trust your son, Jesus, who died on the cross and shed his blood and rose again from the dead your one and only son. I accept him as my savior. And I want a relationship with you. It's that simple, but it's got to be by faith. You have to believe. Lord, thank you for this night. And I just wish your blessing upon each person who hears this. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, everybody, I'm thanking you here again for being with us. And I just ask that you have a wonderful week. God bless you.